are joined in this studio by the Ukrainian MP from Batkivshina party, Oleksiy Ryabchin, who voted for the law, and as well uh, Vyacheslav Lihachov, a coordinator at Vostok SOS, which is a volunteer human rights group which also provides the legal help for the people affected by the conflict. But before we go to the uh, discussion, uh, I'll also present what is in this law. So that's what we can see in the graphic, the most important things. First of all, the law dec declares Russia as an aggressor state. It declares separatist held territories to be temporarily occupied. It places legal responsibility on Russia, although uh, there are questions uh, about how it will function and uh, if it, how it will might affect uh, and free Ukraine of legal responsibilities to its citizens. Also, there is no longer ATO, that's what we have, no an anti-terrorist operation as it had been relabeled uh, as resisting Russian aggression, that's what we have. Also, uh, our next slide should show that uh, joint operational headquarters should be replaced by the ATO, uh, they are replacing ATO headquarters, which means that the military will now be in control instead of the security service of Ukraine. Uh, also, there are new terms, combat areas and security zones, bordering military actions and uh, military and security forces get more power in uh, these zones. As well, the non-military uh, and security forces need permission to be there. So these are the basic things which, which we know. Um, as well, what we know that at the same time, Russian MFA had already labeled the law counterproductive, quote, as it allegedly about military action, not about reintegration. Yet still there are many questions remaining, first of all, how all the things will change the life of the Ukrainians and the people in the um, conflict area. Um, Oleksiy, the first probably question to you. So you voted for that law, so really just explain us why with all the probably questions which are remaining. Thank you very much, dear, dear uh, people. Like, uh, first, I would like to mention that I'm also from Donbass, so for me it was a very personal you know, thing to vote, on, to vote or not to vote for this law. And some small changes to your infographic. We didn't cancel the ATO terminology. It, uh, like, it, uh, like if president will sign it, it will not automatically shift from one regime to another. Moreover, it could coin, coin, coexist together ATO and this uh, new term that we that we entered. This like a small uh, small uh, let's say amendment to your infographics. Uh, honestly, saying I was really like doubting about voting or not for this law, and for me it was uh, like a huge compromise with myself personally, because like for me it's like 70% of in this law is really good, and 30% of this law is like not yet. Not not really good. We call it zrada, you know, in in Ukrainian. So like the treason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a bit of this and more, like uh, about the violation of the human right or possible violation of the human right if this law will be, you know, not respected as the way it is. So for me, it was the biggest compromise. But it was only one amendment among all this, like more than 700 that were uh, named in the parliament was voted. And it was my amendment. So for me, it was, you know, a moral obligation also to vote for this law so we were able to let's say to eliminate almost all zradas you know from from it not yet all but like this for me was a biggest compromise so i voted yes as my as 280 others members of parliament Vyacheslav, so what are the main concerns because there are the wake things and what could be misused so what you would like to and if are the chances to improve first of all as a uh, colleague of mine from the parliament, uh, we are not against the law in general. We agree that in its political part uh, that it makes sense to uh, call their things by their own names, to call the aggression as an aggression, and to remove their uh, counter-terroristic operation, which has a not very strong legal basis to something um, with more strong background. And I agree that uh, counter-terroristic operation has not cancel yet because it w had begun by the order of the president, not by the law. And so it is um, 
in another order of the president need to be to cancel it. It uh, hasn't canceled yet automatically. But uh, we have uh, some worries about uh, details of the legislation. And first of all, from the point of view of human rights, first of all, from the point of view of humanitarian situation, because as it was uh, mentioned in the infographics, the security service and uh, militaries in general uh, have now more uh, power uh, to use their pawns and to uh, provide some actions uh, which uh, from their point of view are actions contra Russian aggressions not only in a battle zone and not only in secure zone but all over the country. We uh, had not a uh, strong definition of what secure zone uh, will be and what will be the territory of secure zone but we have no new um, uh, order of uh, uh, permission, new uh, ideas about uh, permissions to work in this zone. If now to work in counter-terroristic operation zone, uh, only journalists need to have a official permissions. Uh, now, according to this legislation, uh, humanitarian organizations also and uh, any other uh, organizations need to uh, have a special official permission and it will be difficult for us and for other organizations, possibly, potentially, to work in this zone. And it is also some, uh, we worry about freedom of movement for people from non-controlled territory, from the occupied territory, because uh, till now they uh, had to uh, make um, permission to cross the front line uh, via um, electronic form uh, by Secret Service. It is not clear enough how it will be now and is not clear enough if uh, this permission will be enough for them to be uh, in a secure zone. So we afraid that the links with the people in the occupied territories will not be stronger after this law, but will be weaker. And it is uh, not uh, very good news about the new situation. Alexei, uh, it had taken some time to work on the law and there was, um, I would say, there was a discussion in principle, but a lot of details were not really discussed. Uh, we still don't have the, the, the final text on the official webpage of the Ukrainian parliament. So really, in particular, what you would answer on those details, uh, you know, that there are still so many gaps and the, pla the, the things which could be misused, you know, it, it it more or less declares the state of the war, but the other counteraction which should protect the civilian population are not really there or should be later discussed or, uh, or decided by the military without clear concept on what principle they will do that. I completely agree with you and this was my mainly moral problem of voting or not for this because we were working with the Vostok SOS, with many other people with the Red Cross International that they give us some of their amendments and we're trying to advocate for them and honestly saying in the committee we had an opportunity to present them and thanks to the members of the committee they agreed to several of the amendments but for example like today we had a tragical incident in Alenivka where a civilian uh, one was dead and another was wounded because of the attacks on the on the bus and the question is whether the new chief in command on this joint operation headquarter has the right to stop people moving across this border the answer is definitely yes he should stop moving movement because of the accident but the question is whether it will be misused if for example he decided to do it for a week for a month and well, like this is the question that we need to answer further and i, I hope with the, with the help of the uh, human rights organization we will be able to um, you know to control the the military for not misusing the uh, law so how it would be, you know, tackle that issue that those details are not there? What are you going to do? What could be done? And as well, for me, the second question is really this one on the uh, responsibility of Russia. You know, there is 
I mean, in Ukraine, there is little doubt that, you know, when the war had been started by Russia, but in the end, you know, to some cases, as for instance, there are the people living on the Ukraine, on the government controlled territories, there is something happened to them. Uh, you know, what is the legal responsibility of the Ukrainian state in front of the Ukrainian citizens if we know that, you know, Russia is not cooperative? Uh, Yachislav? Uh, first of all, it is not the first uh, law for, uh, in our legislation already exists and the statement that Russia is aggression and the territory are occupied. Uh, and uh, we need to understand very clear that uh, this uh, political statement uh, has no uh, serious uh, basis for the international law. If we in our parliament decided that the Russia is the aggression. It doesn't mean that the Russia will agree, that the international society will agree. According uh, to the um, uh, international legal system, we need to go through the international organizations. We need to go through the International Criminal Court to prove the responsibility of Russia from the uh, aggression from the very beginning, to prove the responsibility of Russia for the contemporary situation and for the population on an occupied territory. But till now, all the population on an uh, occupied territory, they are Ukrainian citizens. And the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian president, ha has a, a responsible, uh, responsibility for their um, rights of movement and, and other human rights. Uh, so uh, this political statement is... Uh, as for me, totally right, but it doesn't mean that the legal situation and the situation of responsibility from the point of view of international society will be um, changed um, automatically after this law. Just to add to this, it's like with the MH17, the, the Boeing that was hit by the Russian, the Russian forces. Everybody knew that they hit by the Russian book. So it is like a genius understanding, but the legal argument is, st is still ongoing on. So we need the legal argument to have a proven facts, and then Russia will not have uh, any chances to, you know, to avoid it. The same is here. We know that there are Russians, but we need help also from the civil society, from international community to prove it and for people to see Russia. And but uh, let me be like very practical. If I live, imagine, if a person lives in the, you know, front line zone and has the house damaged, allegedly by the Ukrainian military, there is, you know, the things are there. You can't wait uh, for Russia in the end pay those money, you know, maybe in decades, but not now. So really, what are, according to this law, the obligation of the Ukrainian state in front of their own citizens? Okay. It's like I will, I will try to say it very briefly. So according to the ATO, if, we, if Ukrainian state conducts the anti-terroristic operation, if something is damaged, it should be repaid by the Ukrainian state. At the, at the, like, according to this law, it's now obliged of obligation of Russia to compensate. Of course, Russia said we are not aggressor, but it was my amendment that passed through the parliament that if a person who lost their house, lost their health, or have so many, I don't know, moral damage, they are able to sue Russia in Ukrainian court without paying the court fee, which is according, I don't know, $300, $500, just to, you know, just to put the papers on court. Then it will be, a, of course, a procedure. But let me remind you that Yanukovych took, for example, $3 billion from Russia. And the Ukrainian state is, suing in the, in, is sued by the Russia in the national court, in the court of London, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I don't know, but since, like, I, I guess we need to repay this, uh, this money, but we won't pay it to Russia. We will pay it to those people who sue Russia, and it will be considered as the Russian money paid to the Ukrainian citizen by the Ukrainian state. So, uh, Vyshlav, do you see the legal framework for the Ukrainian citizens to get their compensation or any kind of uh, de defense and security because of this law? Do you see this legal mechanism? Uh. Is it understandable for the people? <laughs> I'm not sure that it is understandable, not only for the people, but also for the um, uh, professionals, uh, for the loyals. Uh, I think that the only real way is uh, uh, European Court for Human Rights and some of our procedure of uh, international uh, courts, uh, and uh, it is a long distance, uh, but I'm not um, I'm not sure that there is another way according to the contemporary situation. 
so really, there wasn't any case to really, uh, you know, um, not to rush. Because the point of that, somebody would say it's already a long time since all those things uh, should be, uh, you know, implemented, voted. Uh, it's the fourth year of the war we will have this year already. At the same time, there are some details which are just lacking. So there is no, uh, you know, it's hard to understand why there was a need to really do that without that detailed discussion. Was it enough discussion, do you think? prior to the voting. I, I doubt that there are uh, any of kind of discussion, the public discussion on like on the majority of the law that rather implement because we go all, all, everything on a fast track, on a you know fast procedure without a proper discussion, without you know white papers, you know green books, etc. Et so, but we have a hybrid war situation, so we are trying to put a hybrid response on it. I'm not really like I'm a like I, I, I'm a, let's say, scientist by my background. I like to discuss, to examine, to research more, and you know, to do this kind of fast situation for me is not the, you know, not not my business as usual. But this is the, the reality. If we will not respond quickly enough, like we will be overplayed by Russia. So definitely, this law has lots of, you know, disadvantages. And my amendments and amendments of my colleagues from Batkivshina, from Samopomich, from many other, were, you know, targeting these kind of problems. Unfortunately, they were not supported by the coalition. And this is a kind of law, like compromise law. We were able to delete all the, you know, all the amendments regard the Minsk because we were not willing to put the Minsk to the Ukrainian legislation, but they put some other and this was a compromise. That is also the question, maybe Vyacheslav would start and you will go on. Um, you would say, yeah, as, uh, as because you argued for that, that there won't be the mentioning of the Minsk process. Uh, do you think it's really helpful and what, what are your thoughts? I think that there are two uh, parallel uh, situations, two parallel contexts of the Minsk agreements and uh, our talks with, uh, with Russia and our internal political situation. And uh, this law seems to me to be as a political statement for our internal situation. And I am not sure that it will, in, uh, it will be very... Um, serious changes uh, in the uh, process of uh, Minsk talks about concrete questions like uh, 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 freedom of our prisoners uh, in occupied territories and so on. So it seems to me that uh, the uh, political statement in uh, this uh, law uh, will not change the uh, situation with our uh, talks around Minsk uh, agreements. Uh, why you were so much here against yeah, that? Let me put it that way for our international friends. Uh, like according to all the consultations that we uh, did with the you know with the embassies of let's say J7 embassies, they first analysis said this law is not contradicting the current Minsk process. This is clear, like this is sounds very really clear for us. So it like some of the countries from, let's put it that way, from Normandy deformant, they regret that we excluded Minsk. Some of the countries also like who are participating in the negotiation said like they, they understand and no problem with this. But it's my uh, perception that and my political position that like Minsk is a, a like it's not an agreement, it's some kind of a discuss, like it's it's not a legal basis for the Ukraine. So we didn't. At the same time, yeah, but uh, the it was a bill of Minsk president. had passed through the Security Council in the UN, which well, has a high authority. In well, why we should include it into the Ukrainian uh, legal basis? Minsk is a process, uh, like somebody will say it, that like Minsk is a, like a riding on a dead horse, but this is only course that we have. Yes, it's great that we have a platform for discussion, but where is the result of the of the Minsk? Maybe we need to think about some other uh, mechanism of going further. For example, the President Trump proposed, let's put it like, let's move the platform from Minsk to, I don't know, Vienna or Almaty. I don't know whether it helped or not, but people are trying to find a new, you know, new, new breath for this negotiation because they didn't lead to the salvation, so to the solving of this crisis, unfortunately, unfortunately. Uh, coming back to the effect of the law on the, uh, on the citizens, so really, uh, to sum up it all, it's really increased the power of the president, uh, and sometimes th there are the question that if, if, if he really has the solid legal ground for that, and also the authority uh, and power of the military and security units. So if you would finalize, what are the other things to watch out? And 
to be uh, clarified besides these uh, security zones which we already discussed? Uh, actually, um, again, we are not um, uh, uh, totally against those part of the law also, those parts of the law also. There were some corrections which were made during the vote which uh, make a situation a little bit better uh, from the humanitarian point of view also. For example, it was the point about uh, recognition of the official documents about the uh, childbirth and about the death of people. Uh, from the uh, DNR, LNR, so-called uh, separatistic uh, republic to the, to the Ukrainian territory, because till now uh, people need to uh, go through the court to recognize their document about the birth of new child, for example, to uh, give him um, her, her uh, Ukrainian citizen. So there were some corrections that made situation a little bit better. Uh, but what uh, we are worrying about is more about uh, uh, that we don't understand uh, clear how the situation will change, because a lot of uh, subjects are not uh, uh, are not wrote in this uh, law very uh, concrete in a concrete in a concrete terms, and the security zone is an example, and the um, uh, order of the uh, making permission to uh, work to 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 present in the security zone also. We still haven't seen, as, as far as you said, the final official text of the law, and we of course don't know how it will be work in practice. My final, uh, for Oleksii, um, I would ask to be brief. Um, it's not the law on deoccupation and reintegration, but there is also the questions, you know, uh, what, what it really does uh, for, for that, you know, and um, why it's not there? Yeah, I will put it very clear. This is not a law about the reintegration. It more, you know, uh, speculated by the presidential team to say that the president is caring about this territory, so it's like trying to put this narrative. It's not the law about the deoccupation, because nothing about some military action going further. It's more speculated on people from, you know, from more hawkish position to say, like, to sound more, you know, militaristic. It's not the law about the occupied territory because we are not putting our legislation there. Uh, you need, need to, re like, the branding is this law about the peculiarity of the state policy, how to establish a sovereignty. My, my, my question would be really what it gives to the people who probably reside on the government not controlled territories, or it's not really that much about them? Uh, it's not really that much. Well, unfortunately about this, but like my signal to the people who are watching us, like there are people, there are a lot of people in, in the parliament, in the government, and I hope in the presidential administration that care about you and willing for you to return to the Ukraine, uh, you know, to the Ukrainian blue and yellow color. So, and we are doing all of, all of we can uh, to to establish this. And this law is definitely not about cutting you and give you back to Russia. So we are fighting for you and this law is helping us to fight for you, fight back for you to, to have Donetsk, Luhansk and Crimea uh, in, uh, in a sovereign Ukraine and tomorrow will be a big, you know, a big celebration as the date of uh, Sobornist and I, and, and I think it's, it's, very, um, it's very symbolical. Uh, for us. So thanks for explanation. It's a complex topic, but I hope we manage to um, to explain it to the extent it's possible at this stage.